Hello, everyone. Welcome to our eight part lecture series themed uh, Think Urban, Think Inclusive, focusing on discussing approaches uh, for making Indian cities more accessible, safe, and inclusive for everyone. Uh, I am Divya Jindal, your host for the session uh, today. And as part of uh, and on behalf of Building Accessible, Safe, and Inclusive Indian Cities program at National Institute of Urban Affairs, I welcome all of you. Uh, uh, to the lecture series. The series uh, is uh, designed as a discussion with key sector experts, change makers, leaders to focus and collectively think uh, and discuss ways and tools to improve um, lives and empower persons with disability, elderly and young children and their caregivers with uh, everyday freedoms within the urban ecosystem. Uh, before we begin, I just want to give you a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, this is a pre-recorded event. Uh, the platform has a delay of about 10 seconds. So while recording, depending on the internet connection, you may experience some latency in audio and video. The entire lecture will have uh, closed captioning included at the bottom of this recording. The session is designed in a concise format with a short introduction setting up of the context. 15 to 18 minute presentation by the presenter and a round of questions and answers. If you're watching this on YouTube, we encourage you to use the comment section to leave your feedback or post questions. Today for our session, we are joined uh, by Mr. Dipendra Manocha. Welcome Mr. Manocha. For the benefit of our audience, let me just take a minute here to introduce our speaker with all of you today. Mr. Dipendra Manocha is working as a uh, the director developing countries program and lead of training and tech support with uh, daisy consortium that works towards providing publications in accessible formats to persons with uh, print disabilities he's the president of the daisy forum of india he's founder trustee of saksham and vice president of states uh, delhi state branch of national association for the blind he's the key partner in the assist tech lab of IIT Delhi that is involved in development of assistive technology for persons with blindness. He's a member of Braille Council of India as well. As a Shoka fellow, he's the recipient of the National uh, Award, uh, IBN Super Idol Award and I am Lucknow Leadership Award. Welcome, uh, Mr. Manocha. Today, he'll be speaking with us uh, on how inclusive is our education system for persons with disabilities. I'll just quickly share what 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 we have what all we have found on on this very important and pertinent subject uh, with all of you education is regarded as a key to success as well as an empowering tool for any society if accessible to everyone it helps ensure equal sex access to basic opportunities like rights and a dignified life and most importantly the opportunity to contribute better to the society and thus you know, contributing and resulting in a sustainable community development. Uh, not only is education a basic right for all, it is also in the best interest of our societies to educate and engage with those who are disenfranchised and including them in urban planning and decision making. Unfortunately, in India, only 2% of persons with disabilities get access to education and only as few as 0.5% uh, uh, of persons with disabilities benefit from college or university education. Education puts forth itself uh, as a powerful instrument for social change and tools for upward movement within the social structure. Although the ways in which education and learning affect urban possibilities and challenges have been given very little attention in the urban agenda. While cities are increasingly positioning themselves as global hubs for higher education, recognizing that highly skilled workers are critical to offer cities and the economic prosperity alone. The lecture understanding of this clear gap within the urban planning frame framework and the need for recognition, understanding, and the action to strengthen uh, and promote. Uh, better decision making, urban thinkers and academia to rec take cognizance and promote actionable interventions. On that note, I would like to invite Mr. Manocha to share his insights on the subject. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, thank you so much, uh, Divya, and this was absolutely wonderful uh, to have to be part of this series and 
uh, and you know, touching on this topic, which is, I think, a subject which is so close to everybody's heart because this uh, relates to the children, and children are obviously, you know, favorite of all. We just all of us love children. Their and their education is so close to us and such a big concern for all of us. So uh, we are talking about uh, something which is uh, what we actually first of all need to understand is that we are talking about inclusion and we are talking about disability. Uh, so, um, and especially when it comes to education, uh, I would like to draw upon uh, the the thing on these uh, these term that that we use. Uh, first of all, whenever we say disability, um, what happens is that the you know it is often thought that this is a this is a different group, a separate group, uh, which needs to maybe we need a special uh, infrastructure, special things to be done for this group, and which means that there should be a separate school, a special school where they would they need to go. And uh, what, but what really happens is that the reality is that the disability is one of the diversities. So as uh, we may, if we may just have a look at the schools, um, so we would have, uh, you know, gender diversity. So there are boys and girls or uh, you know, there's uh, so much of economic diversity or even simple things like there are the tall and, uh, you know, not so tall children in the class and there can be so many, there's this language diversity. And one of these diversities also happen to be uh, the functional limitations that is caused by any kind of uh, impairment that happens. And uh, so it is that, uh, and if we actually see disability as nothing else but a diversity, then we open up our minds saying that, okay, children needs to be part of the same classroom and same school like everybody else. Um, who are these persons with disabilities who also need to be seen as diversities? There are some very, very interesting facts here. Uh, that WHO actually says that there's 15% of our population in this region, actually it's when we talk about South Asian region, at least 15% of our population actually belongs to this category of persons with disabilities. Um, the Australian uh, statistics say that they would put about 18% of their population in this category. Whereas in India, we say that according to the census, we have about 2% of our population which belongs to this category. Now, obviously, we know that the health services and the other infrastructure, we are not uh, on parity with Australia. And how is it that we have 2% and they have 18%? So the, the, uh, the whole issue lies in between who is recognized as person who needs any kind of um, uh, any kind of special needs have to be met for that person and who all would fall into that category so um, so, so the they, it is just about expanding that numbers uh, by including more people by recognizing this fact that there is a larger population that needs uh, some kind of an accommodation. And I would again put a lot of emphasis on this word on accommodation, which means that we just need to be, uh, um, you know, acknowledging this diversity, people who need any simple or complex kind of accommodation so that they can participate fully in the social activities. So uh, by saying that it is only 2%, we are saying that it is only this 2% who needs any kind of special treatment or some accommodation to be able to participate, whereas actual number is actually much higher, people who may need any kind of accommodation. Uh, 
And it's not that all that is not done. At individual level, at uh, school level, once there is somebody who's sitting in the classroom, we would go ahead and sort of, uh, you know, assist in whatever way we can on uh, helping that child. But the, the main hurdle comes uh, in just getting into the classroom. So the, often the, the myths are that we are a, a normal school and obviously we, you know, we often when we go for admissions uh, for persons with disabilities in these schools, uh, what we commonly hear is that, uh, no, we are not equipped to handle such children in our classroom, so we won't be able to provide any admissions to you. And thus, a lot of such admissions are denied to persons with disabilities in our schools. Um, it is, I think, to be understood very well that our legal system and our uh, uh, responsibility and the whole place where we are in history, we completely acknowledge that, uh, that by segregation, by special schools, we cannot reach out to all the children who need such accommodations. Um, till the time our country had this policy of just a special education or special facilities to be built into school to be able to accommodate children and only those schools where facilities exist, it is where their students uh, with disabilities will go. We were able to reach out uh, with the education to only about 5% of that population that required such education, which was completely unacceptable. That means 95% of those children who were in the school going age were actually out of the school. Today also it is the, the percentage has definitely increased a lot in past 20 years of uh, efforts which has gone in including persons with disabilities here. Yeah. But still we are at about 40 to 45 to 48 percent which still further needs to improve. And what also needs to improve is that quality of education because it's not enough to just to get child to the school because there are accommodation, as I'm again and again repeating, there are accommodations that are required to make that education meaningful for that child with uh, diversity. And uh, so as a result, just by bringing the school uh, child to the school and not providing those accommodation, what happens is that we end up having a very, very large percentage of dropouts. So people will come to the school in primary by the time they reach sixth standard, by the time they reach ninth standard or 11th standard, or university, there is a sharp decline that will have keep happening at every such stage. And reaching to that level, that there's a much smaller percentage of people who will be able to actually complete their education. And then next to it, even people who actually complete their education, are they actually employable in current market? Are they actually skilled with, um, do they have those skills? of reading, writing in mainstream script or those kind of other, other key skills which are required for current uh, environment, uh, you know, it, it's that, that percentage that becomes absolutely minuscule. So uh, that is why what we need to do is to expand the, uh, the percentage of people who are attending the school and also expand the, the accommodations being provided so that children who come to school get meaningful education and are really made literate and educated uh, and not just, uh, and, and we just don't play just the number games here. Uh, this is an, uh, an environment that we would like to share. I often want to share this photograph. Um, like we have, as part of the Saksham's uh, resource center, we include, we help uh, schools to include children with disabilities in their classroom, mainstream schools. And this is one of such classroom where a child with blindness is actually sitting with the rest of the class. And what, what we are actually doing, the kind of accommodation which has been provided here is that since it is a mainstream school, we did not expect that the teacher would know uh, Braille. And so if the child knows Braille, but if she is writing our assignments using, uh, using Braille, the mainstream school teacher would not know how to correct it. So here what change we have done is that this child actually has a laptop in front of her, her 
and uh, the rest of the children are writing using uh, books and normal paper notebooks whereas she is actually working using a laptop and writing the same thing as everybody else and teacher is actually able to see what she is doing like she is able to see rest of the people she is able to the teacher is also able to see what uh, this child is doing and uh, there's full participation it, this is ensuring complete and full participation of this child in the classroom activity whether it is assignments uh, or uh, homeworks or, or or examinations the child is able to actually write without any intermediary uh, she is able to do everything what everybody else is doing and it it's not just related to this um, the, the classroom activity uh, you know we go further ahead i'm not sharing those photographs here but we go further ahead for uh, inclusion in all the other aspects of a school life whether it is cultural activities sports activities etc uh, this child would participate fully in all the activities of the school now uh, just sharing that that why do we need to do of course this is the only solution this is the only way how education can be uh, provided to uh, children with uh, disabilities um, uh, there is also a legal system, legal obligation for every school. Um, we have, uh, and and the one thing that obviously the first thing that needs to do also is that the built environment of our schools need to be made accessible. And there are standards and guidelines which have been put in place. Um, the uh, the the uh, key standards being those uh, are currently listed here. Uh, uh, so that the building will not be issued a cert certification, uh, certification of completion without meeting these norms, there are building bylaws and there are, uh, you know, harmonized guidelines which have been issued that needs to be followed. So uh, what, what do we really mean by accessible built environment that has very well been defined in these standards and these standards need to be followed in the school building also to make them completely accessible for persons with disabilities. Uh, and if this this uh, accessibility is not just related to built environment, of course, the ICT infrastructure also plays a very critical role these days. So whether it is a smart classroom equipment which is being put or the website that is being created or, you know, uh, in the COVID time, of course, the all the online classes now, which obviously will lead to hybrid uh, classrooms. Um, where a lot of this ICT infrastructure is going to be utilized very extensively in our teaching uh, systems, whether those ICT infrastructure is actually accessible or not is also uh, need to be made sure that that is usable by all. Uh, what I can actually say is that there's something called a universal design principle, which means that the, the mainstream infrastructure need to be uh, accessible on its own, or it needs to be designed in a way which is usable with the help of assistive technology. So if there is a website that is created, it has to comply to certain standards. And these standards are now becoming part of our uh, Indian standard system. The Bureau of Indian Standards is issuing the guidelines on, uh, like if you have to procure any goods or any services, they need to comply to these standards and uh, the example that I was just taking up, the web content accessibility guidelines for the websites being created or the, the software user interface being created. Uh, so the comply uh, by complying to these things, it doesn't mean that the, the, the website will become self, self speaking website. What it really does is that it will add features like description to images, very well structured with heading styles, etc or uh, you know, proper tabulation being used in, instead of just using space bar, et cetera. So there are a few critical things which are, which are there that would make, that would define a website that, that yes, this website is actually accessible or not accessible. And what it does is that, uh, as I said, that it doesn't sort of just add speech to the whole website. This website itself will not start speaking, but what would it, it would allow is that my assistive technology, which is a screen reading software, will actually now be able to uh, derive information from 
this website and uh, you know i can i can access the same content like everybody else using my assistive technology so that is where the universal design so there's no separate website created for persons with disabilities is the same website which complies to the standards and it which by complying to these standards it means that it is usable by all so that's a very critical part that we are not trying to create a separate world it's the same universal design principle that has to be adopted for this and one of the reasons why we should do all this actually is one very critical part that that we should know is that this uh, is, you know you know spending all the the efforts that are required to make our built environment and ict infrastructure all that accessible is uh, that uh, that uh, do not see that as an as, as an expenditure first thing like if you make it like your uh, part of your design right at, right at the time of uh, creating such infrastructure the additional cost is very very minimal the cost is only high when you do it as an afterthought if you try to do retrofitting then the cost will be high but uh, if we uh, whatever we are investing uh, we are spending here it's a very very big investment in our future because uh, it makes a huge economic sense that the largest per percentage of our population is actually productive and actually uh, able to participate fully uh, in all these social and economic activities and it's not just the uh, you know smaller percentage that is able to function well and thus become productive or earning people and rest of the population becomes just dependent on them so as this uh, this productive population as large it is the better the economy of our country would be and we would want to have persons with disabilities amongst the productive people and not the people who are dependent on others and so that is why i'm saying that it's a very wise uh, investment to spend on accessibility which enables persons with disabilities to uh, fully participate in the society <clears throat> this is one of the examples of uh, the ecosystem that we have actually created in india um, uh, you know so reading and writing for example for persons with blindness or low vision is one of the biggest hurdles that we used to face the textbooks are not available in accessible format so now uh, what we have is that um, what we are showing here <clears throat> is a is a, is a uh, sugamya pustakale or uh, bookshare kind of an online library and <clears throat> um, all the organizations which are providing services to persons with blindness they are creating books in accessible format and that is sugamya pustakale is working like a central repository we are able to collect all those books here and these central repositories are kind of connected directly to the devices the assistive technology devices of the users um, this uh, so so what we need to uh, the the kind of accommodation which is required for a child who's in the classroom is that uh, if if we are giving paper books to the students we need to connect these students with blindness and low vision to such infrastructure which is which exists for india and uh, we we connect them them to sukamya pustakale we provide them we make sure that the students have the assistive technology devices to be able to access those books in accessible format uh, we can also uh, utilize very uh, you know easy to use solutions for creating accessible digital uh, materials that can be given to Uh, such persons with blindness or students with blindness sitting in the classroom so that they can actually read and write themselves and uh, we remove those intermediaries in between for uh, conversion of uh, such materials into accessible format or keep converting these things to make them accessible uh, what it really takes for in, so besides having all this infrastructure digital infrastructure or these things accessible the teaching methodology itself uh has to be made inclusive so it's not just about creating accessible toilets or putting in ramps or these things or just the websites but we go much beyond this because the teaching methodology itself has to be inclusive so uh, the teachers orientation on how or where to, what to do if they have students with disabilities in their classroom 
Um, it's not that the every teacher would become a special educator, but they should at least know where to look for solutions, where to look for uh, you know uh, uh, the information which is so critical at the time of their teaching. And uh, such kind of orientations is required for uh, for almost every teacher. And such orientation programs are being offered by several institutions and by government organizations, um, government system to, to equip this. Uh, several uh, schools are also going ahead and uh, appointing special educators. Recently also, uh, the court judgment also says that uh, the appointment of special educators need to be expedited uh, at a, at very, very seriously and very fast. Uh, so, uh, a presence of a special educator in the school can go a very, very long way in, in, in ensuring that the institution is fully inclusive for children with disabilities. Uh, we can also have partnership with institutions. So, there are several thousands of institutions scattered all across the country. And uh, any mainstream school can have partnerships with such institutions like, uh, I mean, well, Saksham has a resource center and we partner with several uh, organizations, uh, several schools in, in the Noida region where we provide support, so not just provide support services, but also have teachers from time to time, uh, the interaction with parents, etc. A lot of those activities goes on and, uh, and such resources can be made available uh, uh, through partner organizations. Uh, the, uh, I was mentioning about providing reasonable accommodation. Now, uh, as soon as the onboarding of the student is being done, we need to identify what are the accommodations which are required, and then we need to make sure that those accommodations actually are provided. And these accommodations, some of them are not really those expensive kind of things that I will, I'm talking about. Simple things like whether these uh, students need to be sitting in the front of the class, if there is a child with hearing impairment, what are the kind of accommodations? It may not be a fancy uh, device that is required. They just may need to, uh, you know, teacher may just need to uh, speak uh, facing the students so that the uh, student with hearing impairment can look at the face and understand. And, you know, many of the children are doing lip reading. So they would be able to understand what is being spoken just by looking at the teacher who is uh, speaking. But if the teacher is kind of writing on the board and speaking simultaneously, uh, the, the student may not be able to see the face. Whereas if there is a child with blindness and if writing is being done on the board, it is essential that the teacher actually speaks out what is being written. And uh, that would make it accessible for a child with blindness who's sitting there. So these are several, uh, there are, uh, I've just given an example of where such tips are already accumulated and available. But these kind of handbooks or those, these kind of reference materials need to be made available within the school very easily so that they can just refer to such, uh, such, such uh, things and remove that attitudinal barrier that, uh, oh, what will happen if a child with blindness will come and sit in my school? That uh, attitudinal barrier need to go out. I, I don't think we should even think even once uh, and there should not be any hesitation in it, including because there are resources available around us. And if we use them, if we put them in place, I think we will have a very, very good inclusive society amongst us and especially in, in education where a lot of effort is required to make sure that quality education reaches uh, students with disabilities so that they can be self-reliant and uh, responsible citizens of this country. Um, so, um, there are a few references that I'm sharing on the slide, which can obviously be shared with, with the participants that if you're looking for, um, for an example of how this thing model, model implementation of such things that I've spoken about, you can visit our website saksham.org and look at it or nabdelhi.in, you, you can see how our education programs are being designed and run. Our resource centers are providing support services to mainstream schools. Uh, there, if you are looking for assistive technology solutions, which are the good ones, you can go to sectech.in and you can have a look at that. You can always write to me. Um, I've shared my email ID here uh, for getting any further information. 
So thank you, Divya. I mean, back thank to you. you. Thank you, Mr. Manoja. Such a wonderful presentation. Really, really uh, nice. And also, you know, you touched upon so many uh, interesting aspects and we were already, you know, brainstorming around it. So you've kind of uh, taken up a lot of it through your presentation. Sorry, I've lost your voice. I can't hear you. Achieve better, better models and better um, sort of programs in order to achieve a more inclusive ecosystem within the education domain. And um, and I'm actually, you know, I would like to sort of open the floor now for a couple of questions based on the presentation and based on our our discussion around it. Uh, very uh, in the in the beginning of your presentation, you touched upon a very interesting aspect about uh, teachers and their uh, you know understanding of um, you know uh, understanding and dealing and sensitization for with respect to dealing with a person with disability in the class. So you know we also feel that it's not just about like most schools what they what they offer is perhaps one uh, teacher who may know or one support person who will be somebody who understands these requirements. However, once a child is in the class and he he or she is in going through a couple of um, you know uh, mul going and studying with multiple teachers with multiple uh, on multiple subjects. It is very important that every teacher, you know, himself or herself also understands uh, these aspects and they need to be sensitized as well. And as a, as a result of it, the training of each individual teachers with, you know, how to deal with how to how to manage a persons with certain disabilities in their class becomes very very important which you um, very rightly also discussed in the class uh, in the in your presentation so how i mean it also like do you think of course like what we need uh, do you think we need better programs and investment in training of teachers which can be sort of an immediate or a midterm step to make this transition better, to improve our education numbers, also focusing on better investment, you know, in with within the same aspect to work within the education space in general. So I mean, uh, it goes without saying, yes, that, that there is a need for uh, better understandability of how to deal with diversity in the classroom by teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I would say that it's not just about disability. I think the, the whole thing has to be understood that there are very few who are so-called normal children sitting out there. Majority actually would have some or the other diversity and that uh, little bit of accommodation will, it will be required. Now, very important aspect that needs to be understood is that if we are preparing our teachers for such inclusive classroom, it is actually not just good for those ch children with disabilities. Actually, it is good for everybody. Now, if you pick up any manual on how to be inclusive in your classroom, what are the things that are suggested there? Learning by doing. You know, have have activities where where you can you can um, you know uh, have active participation of children in learning. Let them do things instead of just listening to lectures or reading books. Now, that actually is a better way of teaching for everybody, not just for children with blindness, as you would say. So most of these things that you would look at, uh, the methodologies which are required, are, um, are going to help every child. Now, pick up learning disabilities. Have um, what, what is required is that instead of just putting the information in one medium or just a written medium or a written word, if it is also coupled with audio of the same thing, then the perception increases many folds. Now, this is, this is right for persons with low learning disabilities, but actually it is equally right for everybody else. So uh, the methodologies which will be used for inclusion is going to increase the impact of education for everybody. That is the one very important aspect that needs to be understood. And that is why 
we, it is more important for teachers to be more inclusive. Yeah, very, very well said. Now, another thing that you touched upon in your in your presentation was regarding universal design principles. And what I what what you know uh, what I found very interesting was that in addition to universal design, as we often speak in uh, physical infrastructure or in urban space, you also mentioned it in 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 various other aspects. You know, including that in 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 the way we interact in the way uh, our user experiences with respect to technology or interface or every every aspect needs to be made universally accessible to actually understand the term and sort of acknowledge inclusivity more comprehensively um, uh, i think that that that's a very very interesting uh, sort of uh, you know insight uh, from you because we often tend to be very uh, focused into our sector domains and just understand it from the perspective of only let's say physical environment or uh, social environment but we don't see how, what what do we what does it really mean to be universally accessible as a as a whole uh, or design systems that are completely accessible um do you think there are any uh, do you would, would you be able to share any interesting good practice or globally or otherwise that you have seen or found extreme or any insight that you found in your own work that you think has been very beneficial with respect to uh, this aspect in empowering ch children with disabilities through uh, through an interve intervention of this nature. So, so in fact, one uh, regarding this universal design uh, thing, which is one important aspect that I would like to share is that uh, what, what you just said that we actually think in our our own. Uh, you know, we are, we are so immersed in our own worlds sometimes that we forget the universality of the whole uh, system. And uh, so, for example, um, the, the, even, even for the built environment, the, the architects who are sitting there, if you ask them to design a school for the blind, mm -hmm. you know, they would come up with such wonderful solutions. They would know each and everything what needs to be done to make that building accessible to persons with blindness. Or if you ask them, okay, just make it wheelchair accessible, and they will give you all the solutions. But if you don't use that word specifically, and if you say that, okay, now we are designing a school for uh, for government of India, and it's a mainstream school that we just need to design. And don't yeah. use that word mainstream. Just say design a school. How many of those ask those things that you were just now listing out for schools for the blind would actually fall come into that design? Actually. Frankly speaking, I mean, nobody would even bother looking at that direction. And that is where the segregation starts happening because we think in silos. So this is how the universal design actually has to become because I mean, it's, it's very difficult to understand. So I'll give you another example very, that again, I was uh, making a presentation and asked a question to the public that, okay, here at library, uh, we have, uh, it was a library, uh, subject and I said, what do you think should we, we have to provide service, library service to persons with, with uh, blindness? Should there be, should we make separate libraries for the blind which are fully accessible or do you think that the, all the libraries have to be accessible? And believe it or not, the answer came, let's make libraries for the blind. And you know, so it's, a, it's very difficult for people to currently comprehend that yeah. whatever we are doing in our daily lives, that itself has to become accessible. You know, so that is where uh, the main emphasis has to be that, that we just have to be prepared for inclusivity ourselves right now. I think that that's the main issue. And, and that obviously goes beyond just the built environment. It's the, as you were just pointing out that all the aspects are there, which are, uh, it, it's a full, Full ecosystem where where accessibility has to be provided, and not just one single thing. Whether it is a teaching methodology or the classroom or the teacher herself, what she is teaching, and uh, I mean the, the accessibility aspects are part of each and every. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's you're you're very very correct on highlighting 
uh, this aspect that we even if we think we are thinking inclusive we are still very very isolated in our in our uh, understanding of various aspects and we need to really constantly keep on uh, reassessing and re-evolving ourselves to to become more aware and become all the way more inclusive that's that's and, very and very good. you know biggest paradox that also happens is that often we are talking about inclusion very very exclusively <laughs> <laughs> so we would have sessions especially for persons with disabilities and there we would talk about inclusion so so including persons with disabilities in education has to be debated in where the mainstream education is being discussed so yeah. that is also one of the important aspects because often i have seen that okay uh, i'll give you another example that there is a whole in international telecommunication union has uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's annual events called World Information, uh, WSI's World Summit on Information Societies. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the sessions over there are exclusively meant for inclusion. Now, the whole place would be buzzing with people all around. There will be hundreds of people attending other sessions. But on this session, which is inclus exclusively talking about inclusion, there would hardly be those four or five regular people who know who are already educated, they would be sitting here and attending that session and the rest of the people would fall outside that hall. Yeah. So, so I think that is uh, another big paradox that I often found. Yeah. Right? yeah, I mean, there has been a lot of critique around COP26 this time where, uh, you know, some people who required a full, uh, you know, that some of the some of the places were not completely accessible and some members were uh, supposed to be attending and participating in the events because of certain disabilities they couldn't participate and they couldn't attend events and that's that's extremely uh, you know uh, it says a lot about an event of that nature of a global or uh, at a global platform uh, sure. how how much we really need to work on this agenda right. and how much we really need to sort of uh, re re center ourselves uh, pertaining to these aspects. There would not be any COP26 for persons with disabilities. COP Precisely. Yeah. Well, I also had this very, uh, you know, interesting thought that I wanted to run around you uh, that, that, you know, how COVID-19 has uh, impacted everybody's lives and uh, particularly of students, the way and, you know, children, the way they interact with their peer group and teachers. Um, and, you know, how technology has become a very big tool uh, for uh, and a method uh, for interface between teacher as part of education system. How do you think technology, um, you know, it has become an enabler to some extent, like how do you think it can be, be can better enable or challenge uh, in the coming future within the domain of education and enabling persons with disabilities uh, achieve uh, better inclusion within, with, you know, with respect to ed educating themselves? So this is one of the positive outcomes of the of the COVID. Actually, that uh, we have, uh, you know, you now now the utilization of this whole aspect of, uh, you know, looking at alternatives to the physical environment, and looking at alternatives in a way so that that they can actually make your physical environment they can they can complement your physical environment to be to be made accessible. And the potential of making things accessible by looking at alternatives. I think those are few things which are, uh, uh, you know, some positive that have come out. For example, the utilization of Sugamya Pustakale, which I was saying, the utilization of Sugamya Pustakale shot up to three to four times in April 2020. In just five few days, suddenly the utilization just shot up because um, before that, you know, you were, you were getting other alternatives. Now suddenly, uh, people had to look at this. Now, uh, the utility of the say this thing was was actually very good for everybody even before that, but mm -hmm. people not really looking at it. Now, uh, I say that being um, my my work on technology for past two and a half decades, I often feel that maybe I was preparing for COVID for past twenty years. 
because the kind of technology that we were propagating to introduce all that picture that you saw that was obviously pre covid picture yeah. sitting in the classroom and using that laptop now it was basically that very laptop that enabled that child to actually continue her education right from day one uh, yeah. when the covid restrictions came yeah. so it assumed a different meaning but it's the same tools that we have been trying to propagate yeah. and um, so yes now there is more uh, acceptability that yes these devices are good to use and uh, you know they can they can fill up a huge gap for person mm -hmm. to do so one of the positives as i would say of this whole hugely yeah. negative uh, episode of covid yeah and also it also has opened up um, the the scope and the possibilities that we can have through tools uh like these and how how much more how much more of scale up we can we can think or we can sort of plan for with with tools such so, as these and uh, you know and ensuring that we can create a more enabling environment for everyone as a result and we uh, need to take the benefits of the best of both the worlds yeah not while while we are going back to our uh, uh, mainstream schools is soon uh we should not be losing out on the benefits of this online so because uh, there are there are huge deficiencies if we are just doing online there's no doubt about that the education level is not the same anymore and there are a lot of challenges but yes the the, the online also has a lot of positives mm -hmm. and uh, we i think need to gather positives of both the systems and not forget the positives of the other system while we are uh, in embarking one of the things like for example for especially for uh, enabling inclusion is that now like like for telemedicine there is this tele education uh, which is happening so earlier for example in within our own resource center in noida we were catering to students who were only coming to noida physically to our institution which was being supported by us but during covid suddenly we realized that whether the child is actually sitting in uh noida or whether the child is actually sitting in muzaffarpur in bihar it doesn't make any difference anymore so yeah. our services suddenly expanded and became country wide and the special educator who was providing those support services to the parents and teachers and 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 and, and the children they could do that to a child sitting anywhere in the country so yeah. that expansion because this infrastructure of good quality special educators is actually not there because the whole population is so segregated it's not there in so many parts of the country which can now be filled using technology uh, solutions actually so this is a huge potential which has come up which we can utilize i hope this that just doesn't remain a potential but is actually realized yeah yeah very 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 true um i i i'm afraid we are sort of uh, closing in on our time and i wanted to take this opportunity to thank you mr manoj for this insightful talk and your inputs on on this subject and on behalf of basic team and niua i would like to thank you and for taking our time and sharing your thoughts through this session with us um, it's been wonderful to hear from you and it's always a pleasure to listen to your thoughts and realize the needs to proactively work towards building back better and before we close this session i would like to remind our audience that the lecture is in uh, eight part lecture series and uh, and can be easily accessed on the national urban learning platform and niu's youtube page the link to both of them uh, will be uh, found in the description box below